Hi, Yaten. Uh, I'm going to take you through some of the first questions on the structured paper now. So you can see in question one, it says, figure 2.1 shows a tanker lorry full of liquid. The tanker delivers the liquid and drives away empty. Uh, compare the acceleration of the empty tanker with the acceleration of the full tanker for the same resultant force. Tick one box. So I'm just going to scroll so you can see the options. And let's have a look. So you're comparing acceleration. So initially, I'm just going to write to you, OK, the acceleration of the tanker is going to be equal to the resultant force on the tanker divided by the total mass of the tanker. Uh, and the, the question is asking for full versus empty. It should be fairly obvious to you that the mass of the full tanker is going to be bigger than the mass of the empty tanker. That's quite important. So for a larger M, you should be able to see that the acceleration will be smaller. So that should really help you. And that should be all you need. Uh, so you should see, therefore, when the tanker is full, you will have a larger M, and therefore you will have a smaller acceleration if the tanker has the same resultant force acting on it. So then you've got your options, and you should be able to tell that it's the first box that you tick. The acceleration of the full tanker is less than that of the empty one. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, but the second part of the question asks you to explain your choice. So let me leave it so you can see the choice as I go through. Um, so two marks available. You need to write the following. Uh, a full tanker has more mass than an empty one. Ooh. Very bad writing there, sorry. Uh, the, the first mark comes from talking about mass and using the word mass um, correctly, obviously. And then, so that's your first point. And then your second point would be to say, okay, so A is F over M. So for the same resultant force on the tanker, um, a larger mass leads to a smaller acceleration. Uh, so you're getting one mark for the first bullet point for referring to mass, and then you're getting one mark for referring to the fact that you know you've got the same resultant force and you know acceleration is the resultant force per mass, and therefore you'll have a smaller acceleration. Uh, so those are your two points there. So for part B, it says the empty tanker has a weight of 50,000 newtons. Uh, the forward force is 6,000 and the total resistive force is 2,000 and then calculate the acceleration. So I'm not going to draw that tanker. I'm going to draw a box to represent it. Um, you are told in the question that the forward Force is 6,000 and you have a 2,000 Newtons resistive force. Uh, it tells you that the weight is 50,000 Newtons and weight is equal to mg. So three marks for this question, quite generous I think. The first thing is you need to find a value for m and that's going to be 50,000 over g which is 50 thousand over ten and you're going to get five thousand kilograms that's one mark um, you need the mass because you're trying to find the acceleration and a is equal to f over m you now have m the last thing you have to do is find the resultant force on the tanker it should be fairly obvious to you that if you have six thousand newtons forward in the forward direction to the right in this diagram and 2,000 resistive forces going against the motion, your total is going to be 6,000 minus 2,000 over 5,000 gives me 4,000 over 5,000. Cancel my zeros. Gives me 0 0.8 oh, meters per second squared. 
So your marks come from your math calculation one, another for your resultant force being 4,000, knowing that, and then your third mark comes from getting the right value of acceleration. Uh, so pretty straightforward there. Let's move on to question number two. Okay, figure 1.1 shows a distance time graph for a moving object. The very first thing I would do whenever I see a motion graph is I would write down to myself what I know the gradient of the graph to be because it will definitely be helpful. So a distance time graph will have a gradient that is equal to the speed. So whatever the gradient is at any given point is the speed at that given point. So you can see we're looking from 0 to 40 seconds and what happens. So the first thing is it says describe the speed of the object between the points A and B. So if you're describing the speed, you're describing the gradient. So you describe what happens to it. So you can see from A to B, ooh, that's a very wobbly line, sorry, but you should hopefully be able to see that the gradient value is decreasing. So if the gradient is decreasing and the gradient is speed, then you know that the speed decreases. So you just need to write, oh my goodness, it keeps doing this big line, sorry. You should just write decreases. That should be fairly straightforward to you. It then asks about between B and C. Now this is a bit tricky because I don't have a ruler and a pencil, um, but you should hopefully be able to tell that that is a straight line between B and C. So the gradient value is constant. So if the gradient is constant, then so is the speed. So we would just say con constant. Yeah, does it again. Um, you can work out the value of it. You don't need to. It doesn't get you the mark. But you will be able to find out that it's 20 metres over 25 seconds. Um, it's a constant 0.8 metres per second. If you did that, then great. But so long as you have the word constant in your answer, that's all you need. So state whether the acceleration now of the object oh my goodness, this pen, is zero, negative or positive, shown on the graph between the points A and B, again, and B and C. So we know acceleration in this case is going to be the rate of change of speed. So it's how is the change speeding over time, uh, change speeding, sorry, it's been a long day. Uh, the, how is the speed changing over time? So we're just going to look at A and B for a second. And we could see from the graph that the speed value was decreasing over time. Okay, So that should immediately tell you that there is a change of speed and therefore there is an acceleration. So now we just have to decide whether it's negative or positive. It should be fairly obvious that if it's decreasing, we're going to refer to that as negative acceleration. So you just need to write negative acceleration down. So just always refer back to the gradient and your definitions. And then between B and C, the speed was unchanged. The speed was constant, and so you have zero acceleration. I don't think that needs too much more explaining. So that's part B. Part C is calculating the average speed of the objects across the whole 40 seconds. So your average speed... is equal to your total distance travelled over your total time. So it doesn't matter about what the gradient's doing, you're just looking at your start and your end points. So, so you can see that the total time is 40 seconds from A through to C, and you can see that the total distance travelled is 50 metres, hopefully. That's the end point. Uh, so you're just going to do 50 metres travelled over your 40 seconds taken will give you 1.25 metres per second uh, average. Um, the only other thing is that the values were given to two significant figures, so on the mark scheme you will see that they have quoted their answer also to two significant figures with a unit. Don't forget that. It's not there at the end of the dotted line, so you're going to get penalised for that if you haven't done it. Um, but you should get 1.3 metres per second. I hope this will allow me to scroll. 
Okay, moving on to number three then. We have a wheel F on an axle and it's free to rotate about a horizontal axis as shown in figure 3.1. Uh, so you can see that the axle is here um, and we have a weight threaded W um, and you can see different letters F, P and S. So string S has a loop on one end, let's see if we can get both bits in the question, which is hooked over peg P on the axle. The string is wound several times around the axle and has a weight W attached to the other end. It's released and it accelerates downwards. The string comes off the peg just as W reaches the ground. So it asks you, as W is accelerating downwards, what happens to different things? So the first thing is it asks you about the gravitational potential energy of W. So going back up here, we can see the word it accelerates and we can see downwards. So we know GPE is mg delta h. Uh, so if it accelerates downwards, the height above the rest point, the ground is smaller. So h has got smaller. So therefore, your GPE decreases. I'm just going to ignore that line this time. I'm going to keep getting frustrated otherwise. Uh, so it accelerates, therefore it's speed changes, its velocity changes. Um, kinetic energy is a half mv squared, so if the speed goes up, v goes up, therefore ke increases. This shouldn't be too difficult for you. The gravitational potential energy of f, now I'm just going to scroll up to the diagram again. f is on the wheel. The wheel spins about the axle, but never moves through a vertical distance. So its value h above the ground doesn't change. So therefore, that remains unchanged, uh, unchanged, and therefore the gravitational potential energy of f is unchanged or constant. Any word that means that would get you the mark. Uh, however, the kinetic energy of f will not also remain unchanged because as the weight accelerates downwards, the string will turn and the axle that F is on and F as a wheel will begin to spin faster and faster and faster. And so its kinetic energy value is going to also increase. Hopefully there weren't too many problems with that one. It then asks what happens to the kinetic energy of W when it hits the ground. Well, I don't think that should be a difficult one for you as the weight hits the ground, it's going to come to a stop. If it comes to a stop, its velocity is zero. A half mv squared would then be zero. So you can say decreases to zero. If you just wrote the word decreases, you would get the mark. Um, that's absolutely fine. And then it asks you what happens to the kinetic energy of F after W hits the ground. It will also decrease to zero. It doesn't have the weight providing a force on it anymore. And so you're now going to decrease to zero at the axle. Okay, there we go. So that's your question number three. Oh, there's a part D. The weight W has a mass of 200 grams and 10 joules of energy at the top. What is the speed of W just before it hits the ground? Well, uh, just before it hits the ground, you don't have uh, the collision, so we're not going to consider heat and sound loss at this point. So at the instant before it hits the ground, we consider that all of the gravitational potential energy has been converted to kinetic energy. So in that case, I can say mgh is equal to a half mv squared and it told you that it had 10 joules of energy at the top so therefore the mgh value is 10. So now all I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange this equation so that I get a value for v and then that will give me my answer. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of the half. So I'm going to say mv squared is equal to 10 is equal to 10 times 2. Um, I'm given the mass. Don't forget to convert that into kilograms, please. 
So I have v squared is equal to 10 times 2 divided by 0.2 because 0.2 is my mass in kilograms. And then I can just square root it to find my v value. Plug that into a calculator for mental maths and you'll get a value of 10 meters per second. So your mark points come from recognizing, oh my goodness, one is equal at one. One mark comes from 10 being equal to a half mv squared. So recognizing that your GP at the start is your KE at the bottom. One mark then for your working. And then finally, one mark for your answer. Uh, so that's questions one to three. One of the other physics teachers is going to carry on with some of the others now. Okay, we're going to look at question number four now. So on a day with no wind, a fountain propels 30,000 kilograms of water per minute to a height of 140 minutes. Calculate the power. Okay, so we know the equation for power equals energy divided by time. So we know if we're going to want to find the power, we're going to need the energy and we're going to need the time. We already know the time. They've given us a per minute here. Okay, so we need to know the energy. So the energy required to raise 30,000 kilograms of water to a height of 140 meters. It's being raised up a height, so that's a gain in gravitational potential energy. And the equation for gravitational potential energy, GPE, equals mgh. Okay, so let's first of all work out this energy. Well, the mass of water propelled is 30,000. G for gravity is a constant we should know, which is 10 newtons per kilogram times by 10. And the height they've given us is 140. Okay, if I put all those in together, I will get 4.2 times 10 to the power of 7 joules. Okay, uh, that's the energy required to raise 30,000 kilograms of water to a height of 140 meters. Well, the power now. It's going to be how long did it take us to do that? Okay, so the power is energy divided by time. So this 4.2 times 10 to the 7 divided by the time. Time should always be in seconds. One minute is 60 seconds. So that divided by 60, which equals 7.0 times 10 to the power of 5 watts. Okay, and then that's going in there for mark. So remembering what is the unit of power on the end. Without our unit, we would lose a mark then. Okay, scrolling down to the next part. The efficiency of the pump which operates the fountain is 70%. Calculate the power. Okay, so we know efficiency E equals useful power out divided by total power in, okay, times 100%, okay, right, so what we've got to be careful about on this question is which is our useful power out, which is our total power in. This previous part here, this power we found, that power is the useful power because our fountain is raising the water. In order to do that, it's getting some electrical energy in. So we want the power supply, so I'm going to rearrange that. Power in equals power out divided by efficiency times 100. So our power out we found before was 7 times 10 to the 5. Our efficiency was 
okay, times by 100, that will give us an answer of um, bum, bum, bum. It's an answer of 1 times 10 to the power of 5, 6 even. My bad. Struggling with my mental maths today. One times ten to the power of five. Technically, one point zero. I want to leave that in um, uh, correct number of significant figures, which is two or three. And again, I need a unit, which is watts. I've still written that as five again when it should be six. Sorry about that. Okay, one times ten to the six. If you type that into the calculator, you'll find the answer nice and straightforward. The most common mistake here would be people getting these the wrong way round, our useful power out and our total power in. Okay. On another day, a horizontal wind is blowing. The water does not rise vertically, it's getting blown to the side. Okay. Why does it still rise to a height of 140 meters? Okay, a few ways we can talk about this. Okay. Um, the wind is horizontal. Okay. So the force from the wind is horizontal. So it's not actually affecting the vertical force at all. It has no vertical force. We have the exact same upwards vertical force on the water. Okay. Or we could talk about the fact that the wind has no impact on the gravitational potential energy gain of the water because, again, it's horizontal and we would need a vertical force to change that. Okay. So a few ways we can talk about this. Okay. Um, I would go with wind is horizontal. Okay. Um, sorry. So provides horizontal force. Okay. Um, the um, there is no effect on uh, GPE. Perfect. Okay, that's the end of question four. Okay, so question five. Uh, we've got a meter ruler, and it balances when the 50 centimeter mark is directly above the pivot um, that you can see in the diagram down here. So you're asked to state uh, where in the rule the center of mass is located. Now it would be really tempting at this point to say in the center of the ruler because we know from lots of things that we draw the center of mass usually in a uniform object does act through the center of that object. However, um, it's not strictly accurate in this case because they've actually given us more information. They've said that it's on a pivot like that um, so the answer that they were looking for was above the pivot, um, or you could say directly above the 50 centimetre mark. Um, I guess if you think about it, um, an ordinary ruler, it could have a little bit of extra uh, stuff on one end that would take it past 50 centimetres, so I, I kind of see where they were getting at it with that. I think it's a little bit uh, spurious, but there we go. Um, that's just what I wanted. Uh, it says the center of the of mass of the apple is 25 centimeters from the pivot, and the center of mass of the weight is 45 centimeters from the pivot. And you're asked to calculate the weight of the apple. So one of the things that you want to know or want to understand is that both of these objects are going to be creating forces. Um, here, this will be the weight of the apple, um, and here will be the weight of the masses, um, and it tells us above that that is 0 0.40 newtons. So hopefully what you spot here is I have a distance and a force, and I have a distance and a force that I want to find. So I'm going to be using moments. I know that it's balanced. Therefore, I can say that the clockwise moment 
is equal to the anti-clockwise moment. Uh, the clockwise moment, we're going to turn it clockwise, that's due to the masses. So that will be uh, 0.40, which is the force, multiplied by 45 centimeters, which is the distance. Um, and that is going to be equal to the weight of the apple multiplied by its 25 centimeters. So rearranging, I can say that the weight of the apple is 0 0.40 times 45 divided by 25. Uh, and that comes out at 0 0.72 Newtons. Uh, so I'll just put that down there. Uh, don't forget, this is a force, so we need the unit of Newtons. And then asked for the weight, sorry, the mass of the apple. So for this, I'm going to need to know that the weight of any object is equal to its mass times gravity. For CIE, G is equal to 10 newtons per kilogram. Remember, if you're looking at resources for other examples, a lot of examples um, use 9.8 or 9.81 for G. Um, so just be careful if you're looking at revision materials. For CIE, usually we use 10. Uh, so my weight is 0 0.72, and that is equal to the mass of the apple multiplied by 10. So the mass of the apple is 0 0.72 divided by 10, which is 0 0.072 kilograms, because remember, this is in newtons per kilogram. Uh, you could, of course, change that to 72 grams, but there's no real reason to do so. Part C, the apple is not moved. The weight is removed from the rule, and the pivot is moved to the left until the rule balances, as shown in figure 3.2. Explain why the arrangement in figure 3.2 balances. So this is calling back to part A. What you have to understand is that the weight of the ruler will act through its 50 centimeter mark. We worked that out earlier. Now, the weight of the ruler was acting through the 50 centimeter mark right here as well. Um, but for this case, distance is zero, so the moment is zero due to the uh, center of mass. Now, however, uh, it's not acting through the center, so now we have a distance for the center of mass of the ruler, and we have a distance for the apple. Um, so explain why it balances. Um, so for that, we are going to need the idea that there is no overall moments. Um, or we can say that the clockwise moment equals the anti-clockwise moment. I've written it as M with an arrow. You would need to actually write the word. Um, and then we would say as well that um, there is a force due to uh, ruler weight. Um, and we can say that the moment due to weight is equal to the moment due to the apple. Uh, last question. Uh, the pivot 3.2 is close to the 50 centimeter mark and to the center of mass of the apple. Compare the weight of the ruler to the weight of the apple. Apple. Um, so what we can see here um, is that we know that both of the moments are the same. Um, I know that the clockwise moment is due to distance times the weight, while the anti-clockwise moment um, is due to the distance to the apple times the apple's weight. Um, so what that tells me is because the distance to the ruler is smaller, so I can say that the distance of the ruler is less than the distance to the apple, in order for the two, in order for 
distance of the ruler times the sorry weight of the ruler to equal the distance to the apple times the weight of the apple because dr is smaller and da is bigger um, then the weight of the ruler is going to have to be greater than the weight of the apple so i can say weight of the ruler must be greater than weight sorry of the apple um, to compare the weight of the ruler to the weight of the apple i will say ruler is heavier or well, probably better to just say bigger Okay, so uh, for this question, uh, I've had to switch apps, so sorry it looks a little bit different. Um, but we're going to be looking at uh, a vectors question. So we've got a heavy ball suspended uh, from a fixed beam by two ropes, P and Q. They're both at an angle of 45 degrees to the horizontal. The tension in P and Q are 30 newtons. In the space below, draw a scale diagram to find the resultant tensions in P and Q. Uh, use a scale of 1.0 centimeters to represent 5 newtons, label the forces and show the direction with arrows. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is just make a little note for myself of my scale. So I'm saying 1.0 centimeters is equal to 5.0 newtons. Um, so in this case, uh, my 30 newtons, uh, that will be 30 divided by 5, uh, so that will be 6 centimetres, and this one will also be 6 centimetres. Um, just to work out uh, that, um, and then I need to draw them to the horizontal. So I'm going to do that in this area over here. Um, and obviously what you would probably want to start by doing um, is drawing a line across at zero degrees. Um, and then using your ruler to measure a 45 degree angle to that. Uh, and drawing it down. And you want to line up the ruler so that you can get six centimeters. So if I pretend that uh, one of these divisions is a centimeter, I can say that's one, two, three, four, hang on, is that one, two, three, four, five, six centimeters that way? And I want 45 degrees in the other direction, so they start at the same point, and hopefully this will also be pretty much exactly six centimeters back to that point let's just line up the end of this uh, with the scale so i'm chasing it around a little bit and that's about one two three four five six cool um so i'm going to use the parallelogram method for doing this up on the ones that i have talked to you about before um, so i'm going to drag this whole thing down here. And one of the things you should remember is the parallelogram method. What we do is we firstly draw, oh I don't know how that squiggle got in there, um, with the parallelogram method the first thing we do is draw one of our vectors, so that will be 30 newtons, and then immediately afterwards we draw the second one. So it's that idea of top to tail again. So to top to tail it, I'm going to draw 45 degrees for the next uh, vector. Um, and again, I'm just chasing it around a little bit with this touchscreen uh, ruler, but you should get the idea. That's one, two, three, four, five, six centimeters. So that will be my other 30 newtons. Um, if I went this way, um, then I would have done 30 newtons then, and then I would have to, so that would be, uh, this one would be the same as this one, um, so now I'll need to do this one. Um, so that is again at a 45 degree angle heading that way, and line it up carefully, 
or as carefully as you can and you'll see that again that's one two three four five six centimeters that way 30 newtons or six centimeters 30 newtons or six centimeters 30 newtons or six centimeters now my resultant uh, vector or my resultant force that's going to act in a straight line between the two um, and as you can just about see that should go that should go directly up depending on how carefully you've drawn it like I say it's a little bit tricky to do this uh, on a computer screen um, but that's oh, excuse me but that's uh, my resultant force um, and if I line up the uh, ruler with it, I can see that that goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8.4 centimetres by my drawing. Um, so I, oh, I, do? I know uh, 1 centimetre is 5 newtons. So 8.4 centimetres will be equal to 8.4 times 5, uh, which on my drawing would come to 42 newtons. And indeed, the correct answer is anything between 40 and 45 newtons. So the, result, the resultant should be... Uh, 40, well in my case I'm going to write 42 newtons, but like I say, you can write any number between uh, 40 and 45. Take the direction that is up, directly upwards, and take the magnitude of W. Well, I know that this thing isn't moving, therefore I can say that the total forces going up will look like that. Um, so that will be the resultant force there. The resultant force has got to be equal to W, so you should write for the weight, um, it should be whatever your answer is to the previous part. So I got 42, so my answer should be 42. Okay, so question 7. Um, it says two types of seismic waves are produced by earthquakes. They're called P waves and S waves. P waves are longitudinal and the S waves are transverse. Now that might scare you because we haven't talked to you about P and S waves. They're on some exam syllabuses, but not CIEs. Uh, but actually, you don't need to know anything at all about P and S waves beyond the fact that they've already given you. So, you, first of all, you are asked to explain what is meant by the term transverse. Um, and they've given you a little box here. So what you could do um, in this drawing area is draw a load of uh, particles. Um, and you could draw the direction of propagation. And then you can say the classic, which is that for each individual particles, uh, the particles vibrate perpendicular to the direction to the direction of travel, or, or you can say propagation. And that's a classic example that you should know. Obviously, longitudinal, they transverse parallel to direction of propagation. So another example of a transverse wave. Um, the classic one is electromagnetic waves. Um, water waves also a kind of transverse, they're a bit more complicated. So a seismic wave has a speed of 7.2 kilometers per second and a frequency of 30 kilohertz. Calculate its wavelength. So here we have a speed, which is also a type of velocity. We have a frequency f, and we have a wavelength lambda. So hopefully you can remember the equation that the velocity of a wave is equal to its frequency times its wavelength. Now, they've been a bit sneaky here. This is in kilometers. And generally speaking, um, it's always best to, when you see something in kilometers or anything that is an NSI base unit, uh, rewrite it as the uh, word, as it without a prefix. 
Um, in this case, actually, if you'd have left it in kilometers, you'd have got an answer in kilometers, but it doesn't always work with every equation. Um, and until you get to A-level and start playing around with something that we call dimensional analysis, it's probably always safest to convert, because then you know that your answer will be in base units too. Um, so with that in mind, I can say that uh, 7.2, I can't say 7.2, I've literally just talked about that. 7,200 is equal to 30 hertz times the wavelength. So the wavelength is 7,200 divided by 30, which is 240 meters. Uh, another one where they haven't given you a unit in the uh, mark scheme, sorry, in the, the script, so you must include it. Alright, so we've got an electric bell ringing in a sealed glass chamber containing air. The student hears the bell ringing. The air is then removed from the chamber. State and explain any change. So state means say what happens. So um, the sound gets quieter uh, and then disappears. That's the state. Now we need to explain, and the explanation is because sound needs a medium through which to travel. So a medium um, is just a fancy word for thing. Um, so sound needs something to travel through. Light is an electromagnetic wave. Light doesn't need a, anything to travel through, so it can travel through a vacuum, which is how it gets to us from space. But sound is like that. So classic way of remembering that is I can see the sun, but I can't hear it. There's no air, no particles between me and the sun, which is why I can't hear it. Okay, question number eight is a question on static electricity. So again, a throwback from year nine. Student rubs one side of inflated balloon in her hair, this side becomes positively charged. Explain this. Okay, really common question, this one. They're asking you to explain how something has become positively charged. The key thing you must remember here is it's static electricity. Electrons are moving, not protons. Okay, only the negative charge is going to move when we have these going on. So make sure you never write the positive charge moves. So why does one side become positively charged? Okay, that means electrons, whoa, we've gone a bit crazy there. That means electrons or negative charge, okay, um, has moved from the balloon, okay, or the balloon has lost negative charge, okay, it's become positive because it's lost negative charge, that negative charge must have gone somewhere, okay, I mean, from the balloon to the student's hat. Okay, um, so negative charges move from the balloon to the student's hair. Okay, both marks. Okay, so one mark for electrons have moved from the balloon, second mark to the student's hair. Okay, you just need this idea of the fact that negative charge, the hair has become negatively charged. Okay, and the balloon has become positively charged because it has lost that negative charge. Okay, why doesn't this happen for a metal sphere? Okay, again, a really common question. Okay, um, the answer is, is really, really simple. Metals are conductors. Okay, um, and one of our rules of static from year nine is you must have an insulated material to build up static charge. The reason you can't build it up on a conductor is because the electrons will move about. Okay, there's free electrons which can move to the surface and stop that uh, surface remaining positively charged. 
Okay, so if we rub a metal sphere, we might lose some electrons, but electrons will move from other positions in the sphere to balance that out, and they'll probably move up from whatever the sphere is touching to. So because it's a conductor, we can't get charge stuck in place. Okay, so we can't build up static electricity. Okay, this is question seven. Um, and this one is all about images. So you have a lamp that is a certain distance from a mirror, and you're asked to draw two rays from the center of the lamp that strike the mirror. Use these rays to locate the image and label it I. Now, this is where they've been a bit sneaky. They've said that two rays strike the mirror. So, the trick to doing that is to draw a line that goes exactly from the center of the ruler, uh, sorry, from the center of the lamp to the uh, mirror. Now, this, you can see here, is at 67 degrees. So if I think about my uh, normal here, there's my normal. Uh, so I know that there's just the way that um, this digital ruler um, does things um, is it measures 90 degrees as horizontal. Um, so that means that this angle here is 23 degrees. Now the law of reflection tells me that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So I know that my reflected ray will leave like that. And then what I want to do is pick a different ray that hits it somewhere else. So this one's going at an angle of 81 degrees by the ruler, um, which will be uh, 9 degrees um, in a sensible scale. So, da, 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 da. Um, and that will be 9 degrees. Just mark on here, this would also be 23 degrees. Um, so, I, I want to mark the same angle as the reflected ray over here. So, that's where the reflected ray goes. Um, and now I've got these two rays heading off into the sunset. So what I want to do is trace them back the way they came to find the uh, source of the virtual image. So if I go and trace that back uh, for a decent length uh, and then do the same with this ray, carefully trying to line it up, Obviously, like I say, this is a little bit tricky on a computer, but you guys are going to do this beautifully, I'm sure, when you uh, do it yourselves. And you can see that both of these cross here. Now, for a sanity check, uh, these two objects should be in a straight line from each other through the center of the mirror, which they kind of are, um, and it should be an equal distance on both sides. That's the, um, that's the really key thing to be looking for there. You want uh, the two uh, to be uh, at the same distance. So let's take two characteristics of this image. Um, if we look back, we can see that it is very clearly uh, a virtual image. Uh, and one of the things you should know is that any image formed in a mirror is laterally inverted. What that means is that left becomes right, right becomes left, but up stays up, down stays down. Um, and then you are asked, why is it an advantage to have a mirror above the lamp? Well, uh, less light gets wasted by hitting the wall. Um, the room appears brighter. Um, or you could just say that light is reflected back into the room, um, or the room has, um, or you could say uh, more, uh, room's brighter, anything like that, anything to do with the room getting brighter. 
Okay, then we're saying circular wavefronts from a point source in a tank of water strike a straight barrier. The reflected wavelengths, sorry, wavefronts seem to come from a single point. Mark a dot to show where that is and label it C. So the wavefronts are going to appear as though they've come from an equal distance behind uh, the barrier. So one, two, three, four. This is about four centimeters on here. So one, two, three, four. It's going to be about there um, on your diagrams. Please, when you come to do it, uh, you'll again need to measure these distances with a ruler. So basically the idea is that that distance is equal to that distance um, and they're in a straight line. Um, you're then told, uh, draw as accurately as you can, the reflected wavefront. Oof, this is a little bit tricky, um, but the idea is that as soon as it reaches um, the barrier here, it's going to reflect and start moving the way it came. So the trick to this is you want to take your compass and with your compass mark out a distance that is the same as that one. Um, and then you want to put your compass um, so that the, the pencil is here um, and the other part is somewhere along this line um, so that you're keeping it as the same distance. Um, and then it's going to draw out something like that for the first one, and then for the second one, and sheesh, this is hard to do on a computer screen. It's going to look something like that, but obviously a little bit more accurate depending on how well you've drawn it using your compasses. Okay, question number 10. Question number 10, we've got a large crane with a mass and it's on a muddy building site. Okay, there's our crane. It's got a mass of 8,500 kilograms. That's an important fact. I don't want to forget. Okay, and it's asking me to find the weight of the crane. Really nice, simple one mark question. You just need to remember the equation. Weight equals mass times gravity, and gravity equals 10 newtons per kilogram. A fact you need to know. So all I've got to do is this is equal to 8,500 kilograms times 10, 85,000. Careful, we need a unit here, and weight is a force, so we need the unit newtons to get the mark. Okay, next part. Pressure. Okay, calculate the pressure. They've given us the area. Again, equation we need to remember. Pressure equals force divided by area. Okay, um, our force, nice and straightforward, we found before is equal to the weight, 85,000. Our area, be careful, 3.4 meters squared. However, it is on two caterpillar tracks. Each is 3.4, so the total area is 3.4 times 2, which is 6.8 meters squared. So I'm going to divide by 6.8, okay, um, which will get me an answer of, um, let me just type that into my calculator, 85,000 divided by 6.8. Okay, so depending on whether I leave it to two or three significant figures, okay, I'm going to get uh, 120, 12,500. Pascals, and again, I need a unit for my pressure. Okay, I could also put uh, newtons per kilogram for my unit here, and that would be fine. Okay, so 12,000. If I want to put that to two significant figures, that would also be fine. We can have two or three, that would be 13,000 Pascals. Okay, next part. The crane driver walks towards the crane, he starts to sink into the mud. He lays a wide plank of the wood as he walks along the plank. Why does he not sink? Okay, so key thing here, the reason why someone sinks is because of their pressure they're exerting on the ground. Okay, so when he puts a wide plank of wood down, okay, increases area, 
in contact with the mud. Okay, so he's increased his area. Okay, and that means we know pressure equals force over area. So his pressure has decreased. Done. Okay, nice and straightforward one. Um, okay, part C. And now tying in lots of ideas. We've got weight, we've got pressure, now we've got moments. This is just, okay, a chance for you to remember a definition. The moment of a force, okay, the moment of a force is the force, okay, times the perpendicular, really important, distance between the force and the pivot. Okay? The moment of a force is the force times the potency of the force. Okay? Um, sometimes we say what actually is it? It's the turning effect of a force. Okay? So it's the turning effect of force. It's a force that makes something turn. Okay? Um, and to find it, it's the force multiplied by the perpendicular distance between the force and the pivot. You need to include perpendicular in that definition. Okay. Despite the moment, it remains in equilibrium. What are the two conditions for an object to remain in equilibrium? Equilibrium means it's not accelerating. So whether that's it's accelerating along, moving left to right, up or down, or whether it's starting to spin faster, we want either of those to happen. So there's two things we need. So for something to not be accelerating left, right, up, down, we need there to be no resultant force. And for something to not be starting to spin faster or slower, okay, we need no resultant moment. Okay, so you just need to remember those, no resultant force, no resultant moment, and something will remain in equilibrium. That is the end of the question. Okay, so my final question on this paper is question number 11. Uh, figure 8.1 shows a circuit that contains a battery of EMF 6 volts, an ammeter, a 20 ohm resistor, and a component X. So you can see X over here. Now, question AI asks you to state the name of the component X. That's just a recall. So you should either have written, hopefully, variable resistor, which I'm imagining most of you did, or some of you may have called it a rheostat, which would be fine. But variable resistor will get you the mark. Easy peasy. Uh, the potential difference across the 20 ohm resistor is measured with a voltmeter. On figure 8.1, draw the symbol for this voltmeter connected to the circuit. I'm going to predict that some of you have missed this mark because there isn't a dotted line for you to do any writing. And so often students don't really read the question carefully enough and they miss the small one marks like this. So we're going to draw the voltmeter on the uh, circuit diagram. And it's across the 20 ohm resistor. So we know that voltmeters are connected in parallel and it's across the 20 ohm resistor. So it should be... Pretty straightforward for you, where your branch is over the top. You do not want your arms or your wires to come in and touch the resistor. Okay, so they're going to come out to the other sides. Uh, pencil, please. Uh, voltmeter with a capital V. But that's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm not too worried about that one. So the next bit says the potential difference across the 20 ohm resistor is varied from 0 to 6 volts. For each value of potential difference, a corresponding current is measured. Okay, and then it asks you, on figure 8.2, the graph, draw a line to indicate how the current measured by the ammeter depends on the PD across the resistor. It's worth three marks. Okay, so this is where most of your marks are coming from in the question. Now, you are trying to find current values for specific voltages across a specific resistor. So the first thing we're going to do is write down the equation that we need. And we know 
that V is equal to IR. But you're trying to find values for the current, so I'm just going to rearrange that and say, okay, I is equal to V divided by R, and R, we know, is always 20 ohms. Okay? And then you're plotting a graph for what the current is when we put different voltages across that resistor. So the easiest thing to do is to just look at your minimum and your maximum. Um, you know it's a resistor, so you know it's going to be directly proportional. So you know you're looking for a straight line graph. Um, so we are going to look at the minimum at 0 and the maximum at 6. You can see current I is voltage divided by resistance. If I have 0 volts of voltage, I have no current. So at 0, I have 0 over 20 gives me 0. Amps. Okay. When I have 6 volts, I have 6 over 20 is going to give me 0.3 amps. So that will get you one mark for that calculation. Okay, your second mark comes from knowing this equation. Should have said that first. And then your third mark comes from a straight line with a pencil and a ruler to within half of one of these small squares. So when I talk about the point values where you plot it, it needs to be correct to the nearest half of one of these. Um, and it's going to go from 0, 0 to 6, 0 0.3. I can't plot this nicely because I'm doing it on a computer, but yours needs to be neat. It needs to be a thin line um, that is very clearly plotted in the right place. So you're going to plot your two points. Neat squares, please. This bit, I don't know what this is going to end up looking like, but it needs to be a straight line between the two. That's not too bad. And that will get you your third mark. And that is the end of question 11. Okay, question number 12. Question 12, we've got a solar panel which is being used to heat water. Okay, so if we want a solar panel to heat water, we want to turn sunlight into heat energy, which we can then use to heat our water. So what we want to do is we want a solar panel that absorbs the most water and then conducts it as quick as we can, and as efficiently as we can, to the water itself. So why would we make our pipes out of copper? Okay, we want the heat to get from the sun, from its heating up that glass sheet, okay, or heating up, going through that glass sheet, sorry, um, and heating up the copper and get to the water as quickly as possible. Okay, so to do that, we want something which is a good conductor. So copper, we know, is one of our best conductors. Okay, so copper, why? It's a good conductor of heat. Okay, why are they painted black? Another thing you know about black, black is the best absorber of heat energy, and we want to absorb heat energy to heat our water. So why black? Okay, black is a good absorber of um, heat for infrared radiation. Okay. Why do we have an insulating metal attached to the metal backing sheet? So why do we have this insulating material here? Well, we want this heat energy to be all going into the water and not going into heating the roof or the building itself. Okay, so the insulating material is to um, uh, reduce heat lost. Um, um, reduce heat lost from pipes, okay? Because we don't want heat to be lost from the pipes, we want them to stay in that water in the pipe itself. Okay, why does the presence of a glass sheet increase the energy collected by the water? Okay, a few ideas we can go down with this one, a little bit of a, of a strange one, one we may not have looked at. Okay, 
Remember, we want to trap this heat energy in here. We want the heat energy to stay in the pipes. So if the pipes are getting rid of that energy they've just absorbed, that's a bad thing because our water's cooling down. So what we have here, if we put the glass sheet over the top, is we are preventing... Okay, so one thing we could talk about here is we are preventing convection currents. Okay, preventing con convection, um, transferring... I'm going to ignore that bit. We just want to prevent convection. Here's the simple part, because that will transfer heat away from the pipes. Other things we could talk about is that it traps the air in, so the air can't get away. Okay, um, and it means this air gets heated, and we've got like hot air surrounding our pipes. Okay, the key one I would go with here is uh, preventing or reducing convection, taking heat away. Okay. Always looking back to what we've learned about conduction, convection, and radiation here. And so we've kind of included all three in here. We had conductor in the copper, we had radiation with the painting black, and we've got convection with our glass sheet, preventing the heat rising away and taking our energy away. Okay, carrying on to the next part. We've got four metal plates, um, identical ones, but they're different colors. Which one has the fastest rising temperature? Okay, so we want which color is the best at absorbing heat energy, okay? And the answer is matte black, okay? You've just got to remember that order. Matte black is the best absorber, and it's just like with light energy, okay? The reason why something is black is because it's absorbing all the colors of light, okay? It's also a really good absorber of infrared radiation, too. Shiny. Shinies is like a reflective material, something shiny, I mean it's probably reflecting. So we don't want to be reflecting, we want the matte, okay, which is not reflective, and black is the best absorbing colour. Okay, part B was a weird question. We've got a Leslie's differential air thermometer. So what they're doing here is they're throwing you a curveball, something completely new you haven't seen before, but something you should be able to use your knowledge to answer. So, we've got a glass bulb painted matte black here, and we've got a shiny glass bulb here, and we've got a heat source heating up both of these. Okay, we know from the previous part, matte black is the best absorber. So this side, over here, will be absorbing more heat energy. So this one will um, heat up more. Okay, so we know that one's going to heat up more. Looking down here, the pressure is equal in both, and then we shut the switch so air cannot get past this valve here, okay, and then the heater is switched on, okay. So, um, we've got water in between. Why is that liquid going to move? It's going to move because as the air heats up inside our two glass bulbs here and here, it's going to increase its pressure. If the pressure increases, it is going to push the water down. The black, matte black side is heating up more, so its pressure will increase by more, so the water level on the matte black side will end up being pushed down. Okay, we've got a smaller force pushing down here, so it's not pushing down as hard. So that means the water that got pushed down over here is going to then move up here. So we're going to have the water level rising on that side. Okay, so we've got the water level goes down on that side and up on the other side. Okay, by roughly equal amounts. Okay, because if this water is dropped by this so much, okay, then this one must have risen by the same amount. Okay, we've got to explain this now, and I've kind of already started explaining it. Okay, so the first step is the black side um, absorbs heat energy faster. Okay, so the matte black side absorbs heat energy faster or absorbs greater heat, okay? Um, this means 
on the matte black side, okay, the um, temperature increases more on black side, okay, so the pressure will also um, increase more. Okay, so we've got more, a greater pressure on the left-hand side uh, than the right-hand side, so the liquid will be pushed further down on that side. Okay, so matte black side absorbs heat energy faster, it'll get reach a higher temperature, so it will have a higher pressure and push the liquid down. And we finish the paper. Well done.